good to be able to bring the word of the Lord to you this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you that we can come around your word. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would move upon this word, that it might become a living word to us, Lord, that it might become spiritual food for us this morning. Lord, I thank you for the people that have gathered here this morning to hear the word of God, and I pray that they will be blessed. Lord, I also pray that Jesus Christ will be exalted in our midst, that he will be lifted up, and his name be honoured here today, Lord. Pray that you would teach us by your Holy Spirit the things that you want us to learn, Lord, that we might grow thereby. Lord, I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You will forgive me this morning if um, I preach, to quote Paul, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Because what I have to say this morning is quite plain, really. It's quite uh, stark, I guess you'd say. It could even be a little discomforting uh, in, its, in its bleakness. And yet for the believer, hope remains. For the believer, um, that there is an, a an answer to the question, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And, and I think if you're a believer this morning, you know the answer to that question. We've been having a look at what is commonly called the Song of Moses. It's quite interesting actually. It's probably it's the oldest song that I can think of that's been recorded. Uh, it predates the Psalms. I think one uh, scholar, and they are sort of notoriously cautious in this, uh, dated it as about 1400 BC. Uh, but suffice us to say, it's a very old passage of scripture and a very old example um, of, of a written, the written lyrics or words to a song. So let's have a look at it. We've been looking at Exodus chapter 15. If you have a Bible with you, please follow me. Exodus 15. Song of Moses. And I guess we've been pro progressing almost verse by verse. And um, I want to read to you from verse 5. Which says this. Exodus 15 verse 5. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. This is the very last, if you like, of the historical part of the account here of Pharaoh's army, the Egyptian army, uh, as they pursued the Israelites. You'll remember God had opened up the Red Sea and the Israelites proceeded through on the dry land. And as they came out the other side, God closed up the waters and destroyed the Egyptian army. And this is, this is just really the, the last of that factual account of what Moses is just describing. What happened really, he's, he's, he's retelling uh, the, before the Lord, Lord, you did this. And that's a great thing to do, you know, if you're in your prayer life, if you come before the Lord and you say, well, I just don't know what to pray. Talk to God and, and, and tell God, Lord, you did this in my life. Lord, you helped me. Whatever it is, Lord, you, you healed me. You forgave me. And you will find that your perspective, the way you see your life, and the way you see particularly difficulties and, and, and hindrances in your life will start to change. Because what you're doing is, you, God already knows what he did. <laughs> you know, God has not got, got, got a poor memory. But you and I have. We forget what God has done for us. And it's good just to remind ourselves of all the good things that God has done for us. And, and this is what, in this, this short verse, that Moses tells the Lord, 
He says, the depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. The title that I want to give this, this particular sermon this morning is The Great Confutation. What's a confutation? To confute somebody is to prove them wrong. Uh, it's usually to do it with the written word. And I think that the, the written word of the scriptures, particularly here, confutes, it proves wrong the assumption and the assurance of Pharaoh and his army. They assumed that because they had the weaponry, they had the might, they had the chariots, they had the skill, they had the authority, they would have been, I guess, the strongest power in the world at that time, that pursuing a few slaves who believe in this one God, not a problem for them. But what God has done, and what Moses does through these words, is completely confute them and show them they were wrong. God has proven them completely wrong. They sank to the bottom as a stone. In fact, in verse 10 it says, they sank as lead in the mighty waters. Probably due as well to their, their weapons and their armor that they were carrying, but the depths covered them over. And you know, this is the fate of all those actually that oppose God. This is the fate of all those that oppose God and oppose His people, the church is that they will sink into the depths. Not into the Red Sea, but they will sink into the depths. And they will be condemned. And you might say, well, hang on a minute. Doesn't Jesus say something about that, that he came as the saviour of the world, that not to condemn people, but that through him they might be saved? So let's have a look at it. Uh, it's John 3. John 3 Thomas always says to me you, 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 you go to all these different places in the Bible and I think where is it going next but at the end you bring it all together so I'm hoping I'm going to be able to bring it all together at the end God willing ok John chapter 3 John chapter 3 and probably some of the most famous words in the Bible verse 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to, con to condemn the world, but the, the, the world through him might be saved. Great truths, aren't they? Wonderful truths. That's right. Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. But you know, a lot of people stop there. And they don't read on. Because verse 18 says this. He that believeth on him, that is on Jesus, is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That's the truth is that the depths... The depths have covered them. And that's really what John 3, 17, 18 is saying. Is if you don't believe on Jesus, you will sink beneath the depths. In the book of Proverbs, Solomon um, gives us a comparison. He compares uh, what is called the house of wisdom with the house of folly or the house of foolishness. And, and foolishness in Proverbs is, is personified often as a, as a woman. And we read that, that this woman is luring the simple. She's luring the immoral. And, and, and the Bible has her saying something. It says that she says, Stolen waters are sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. Isn't that what the devil says? Isn't that what he's promising you? Stolen waters are sweet. That which is unlawful will be good. It will be good for you to have that. 
and bread eaten in secret. Nobody will know, nobody will know about your sins and you can enjoy them. And the Bible says that that's foolishness. Why? Because one day God will expose all of that. One day it will all be seen. Because God does not look upon the outward appearance, He looks upon the heart, doesn't He? And so the things that you thought only you knew about, nobody else knew, God knew. God, knew. God sees our hearts, doesn't He? What we are. And whilst we can put on a front and we can be a certain way with people and put on what I call the Sunday smile, underneath it there is a heart, isn't there? Underneath it is who we really are, the real person inside. And God sees that. Stolen waters are sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. These are, these are the, the temporary pleasures of sin. But Proverbs 9 verse 18 reveals that there will be punishment for such. It says that the fool knoweth not that the dead are there and that her guests are in the depths of Hell. That's the depths I'm talking about this morning. Pharaoh's army was submerged beneath the depths of the water. Beneath the depths of the water. But those who oppose God, those who oppose the word of God and the people of God, will be submerged under other depths. Under other depths. Let's have a look at Matthew, Matthew 25. Just start bringing out a few scriptures now. Matthew 25 and verse 41. This is Jesus, don't forget, speaking. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. Prepared for the devil and his angels. That punishment was prepared for the devil. Was prepared for his angels. But since uh, Adam's sin. Since we now have this propensity to sin. It is now opened up beyond just the devil and his angels. But to those who oppose God. To those who are lawless, disobedient. For the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and the profane, or simply just those who do not believe on Jesus. You see, the Bible says that God, through Jesus, sent the Holy Spirit to reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin. Jesus says, because they believe not on me. John 16, verse 9. That's what, it's, that's what the Holy Spirit, who is the comforter to the people of God, who is the comforter to believers, actually comes to bring conviction to those who are in sin, to those who do not believe on Jesus. I once heard someone say, uh, God doesn't call people to repent of their sins. He just calls them to repent of not believing on Jesus. Well, I've got news for you. According to John 16, that is a sin. And we read that those persons will drink the wine of the wrath of God. They'll drink the wine of the wrath of God, and that the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. A lot of churches are comfortable preaching, for God so loved the world. How come they don't touch on these verses? How come they don't tell the full story? That Jesus came to save, praise God. And I'm glad that he saved me. But he also will return to take vengeance on those who do not believe in God and do not obey the gospel. 
That's what the scripture teaches. And as I said last week, it would be it would be disingenuous of me not to tell you and not share with you the whole message of what the gospel is. It was good news when God delivered the children of Israel out of the hands of the Egyptians, wasn't it? It was good news for them when they saw that, those waters coming back together. And I imagine there was, there was a, big, a big splash of water as they saw before their very eyes the whole Egyptian army sink beneath the depth. I imagine that was just amazing to see. And there they, they'd gone. The taskmasters, those who bullied them and who, who'd kept them in bondage, those who'd made their lives a misery, the might of Egypt just sunk beneath the depths. It was good news for the children of Israel. It wasn't good news for the Egyptians, was it? It was their condemnation. It was their utter ruin. And that's what it will be like. On that day when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, it will be good news for those who put their trust in Jesus. Those times that we spent suffering, uh, suffering persecution, people around the whole world who are suffering for believing in Jesus, even now, even today, it will be good news for them when that trumpet sounds and the, when they hear the voice of the archangel and Jesus Christ returns. But it will, oh, excuse me, it will not be. It will not be good news for some other people. And yet, in the midst of this awful thought, to think that people might sink, as it were, beneath those depths, that the smoke of their torment will ascend forever and ever, and that they might have no rest, day nor night, as the scriptures reveal. Even in the midst of all this, this, this picture of Pharaoh's army being destroyed underneath the depths, there is actually a beautiful truth for those that yield to God, for those that yield to the cross of Christ. It is that God says through the prophet Micah, God will subdue our iniquities and he will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. You see, the, 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 for those who trust in Christ, you will not be plunged beneath the depths, you will not be covered over by the depths, but rather your sins will be covered over by those depths. And um, there's a great uh, couple of verses that just follow on. I want to look at from Exodus 15 where we've been looking and um, it's just as they come to the other side, the other side of the Red Sea and in verse 24, Exodus 15, 24, it says the people murmured against Moses, it doesn't take them long does it, the people murmured against Moses saying what shall we drink? Because they come to a place called Marah. Mara means bitter. And there's water there, but they can't drink the water. The water's bitter. And they start to murmur, how are we, how are we going to drink? How are we going to look after ourselves? You've delivered us out of the hand of the Egyptians, but what now, Moses? What now, God? Maybe we're a little bit like that sometimes. Well, well God, you've blessed me in this, but what now, Lord? What do I do now? And in verse 25, it says that... Moses cried unto the Lord. That's the answer, isn't it? First of all, we must cry unto the Lord in prayer. He cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. Um, I believe that, that that piece of wood, that tree, is a shadow of the cross. I believe it's pointing to Jesus who was to come, who makes that which is bitter sweet, who takes out that heart that is stony and gives us a heart of flesh, who takes your life, or my life, that, that was, was a life of uh, delusion, walking in darkness, walking in sin, and he makes it uh, a good life, 
a life that, you know, you in Psalm 23, where it talks about how he leads us beside the still waters, doesn't he? Uh, that he leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. That's the life, that's the walk that we have. He doesn't promise that there isn't going to be any challenges or difficulties that we meet, but we are no longer alone in that war. Christ, the good shepherd, is leading us. And so I think it's a beautiful picture. I believe that's what it is. It's a shadow of the cross that was to come, making that which is bitter sweet. So we see that they were the, the, the depths had covered them over. And also as we as we read on in Exodus uh, 15 Verse, verse 6 says, Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. The right hand of the Lord is glorious in power. This is the second what we call anthropomorphism, where God is, is given the attributes of a human. You know, we did it last week. We talked about God is, is a spirit, the Bible says, John 4, John 4 24. God is a spirit. He, he's not uh, uh, limited by a body of flesh like we are. And yet sometimes the Bible will give human attributes to God to explain what God is doing. And here it talks about uh, uh, his right hand. That is to say the strength of the Lord. There's, a, there's an old hymn by Charles Wesley. It's not a very well known one actually, but it goes like this. Arm of the Lord, awake, awake. Thine own immortal strength put on. You see, God's strength, the strength that he puts on, is not armour. It's not, you know, pick up a heavy sword or, or put on the, you know, or even pick up the very latest weaponry. God's strength is himself. That is the, the, the armour that he puts on. That is the power, the glorious power that God has, is God's own strength, his omnipotence. It is a strength that brings both judgment upon the Egyptians and salvation for the Hebrew slaves. And it's just the same today. God's strength, God's power will bring judgment upon the wicked and it will bring salvation to the righteous. Those who are made righteous through faith in Jesus Christ. So there is a choice to be made here, isn't there? Will you take the choice of the Egyptians who looked to their own strength, looked to their own abilities, trusted in the fact that they had a strong army, they had a good leader? They had a reputation in the ancient world. Or will you take the example of the Hebrew slaves who looked to God? They had nothing else. They had nothing of themselves. So through Moses, they looked to God. There is a choice to be made this morning. Just turn to Joshua. Joshua 24. Save this for you, Bradley. Joshua 24. Verse 14. Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. There's, first of all, there's the message, isn't it? There, there's the ultimatum. Put away the gods of your fathers. Put them away. Those on the other side of the flood, those in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. That's a command. Serve the Lord. But then he introduces a choice. Verse 15, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, 
or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Some power isn't there in that last statement. Joshua is saying, you do what you want. He's saying, understand that your choice will bring with it eternal consequences. Okay, I'm bringing that together with what the New Testament reveals. It will bring eternal consequences for you if you choose these other gods. Here's the commandment. Uh, serve ye the Lord. That's the commandment. Remember Acts 17 says God commands all men everywhere to repent. To forsake their sins and to turn to the Lord and believe on the Lord and find salvation. Serve ye the Lord, but you can serve who you want to serve. But he's saying, but as for me and my house, as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. I want you to take hold of that this morning. It doesn't matter what other people do. It doesn't matter how popular or unpopular Jesus becomes. The question is, what will you do? Will you serve Jesus or will you look to other people's gods? That doesn't have to be an idol chiseled out of stone. That could just be what other people build their lives around. Who will you turn to uh, and put in the place of God? The right hand of the Lord is glorious in power. We, we need to look to the Lord and understand that He is able, He is able to, just as He could deliver the Israelites out of the hand of their enemies, out of the hand of those wicked taskmasters who brought them into bondage, in the same way Jesus Christ can deliver you and me out of the hands of our enemies, out of the hands of those spiritual forces that bring us into bondage uh, and that made our lives a misery, that kept us in ignorance and foolishness. He delivered the Israelites out of the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he can deliver you and me out of the hand of the devil, who the Bible says is the God of this world. In the same way, he has the power. My God has the power to deliver. His power is not dimmed in any way. Now when we come to follow God, when we come to live our lives in this liberty that He has brought us, there is something that is an absolutely essential part of being a Christian. And it's often been explained like this, that God sets us free through Jesus, but we are set free for a reason. We are set free to serve Christ. We're not set free just to do as we please. I'm free now. I can do whatever I want. Yes, all things might be lawful for me, but not all things are expedient. So now, I am not my own to just do as I wish. I am now set free to serve Jesus Christ. Jesus himself explains it, Luke 17 verse 10. So likewise, ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded of you, say, we are unprofitable or unworthy servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Don't hear a lot of people talking about duty today, do you? Quite an old fashioned word, and yet that's what the Bible's talking about. As Christians, as believers, we have certain duties that God expects us to fulfill. We are the servants of Christ. And therefore we ought to put him first in everything that we do. Um, Bob Dylan once sang a song. Uh, You're going to have to serve somebody. It might be the devil. Or it might be the Lord. But you're going to have to serve somebody. I'm not sure who he's serving at the moment. But anyway, I, I do subscribe to that. To what is, is said in that song. Look, it, it is that simple. Either you're serving the Lord or you're serving the devil. Now, now, which will it be? Who will you have as your master? 
There's no third choice. It's, it's the one or the other. And having, having at various times in my life served both, I know which master I prefer. And that's the Lord Jesus. See, if you're not serving Jesus, then you are serving the other choice that I gave you. Who, who ironically, is the adversary of your soul. You're actually in service to your enemy, to the one who wants to hurt you and harm you, kill and destroy. There's an important principle mentioned here in, we go back to the Song of Moses in Exodus 15. Verse 12 says, Thou stretchest out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them. The earth swallowed this picture of uh, what we call Sheol, the place of the dead. So we see all the way through Exodus, we see that the Egyptians were idolaters. And we see that God punished them for it. We see that uh, the Egyptians opposed Moses. God punished them for it. They would not obey God. So God <coughs> punished them for it. Just skip ahead here. That was the problem with the Egyptians, wasn't it? But what's interesting is we see later on through the Old Testament that the Hebrews themselves, the children of Israel, those who were supposed to be God's people, that they became idolaters. And God punished them for it. We see that they opposed Moses. And God punished them for it. We see that they would not obey God. And again, we see that God punished them for it. What about you and me? And you might say, well, that's all very different now. Because you see, it's all about the love of God. That was the Old Testament, and I'm under the, new, the, the Old Testament, under the New Testament, under the New Covenant. And now, it's not about obeying, you have to do as God tells you to do. No, now it's all about love. Jesus, uh, uh, God is love, and Jesus encapsulates it. That's true. I'm glad that God is love, and I'm glad... That, that we are loved by Jesus. I'm glad this morning that Jesus loves you. But you see, we have a problem when we start to define what love is. Uh, love is not some uh, schmaltzy, uh, kind of Mills and Boone experience. Uh, when the Bible talks about love, it also includes that other word that I talked about, duty. The Bible means something far heavier when it talks about love than, than, than just an emotional uh, response. In fact, uh, Jesus puts it so perfectly that I'm just going to quote him. He said, If ye love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 15. How about that? Jesus has commandments. Yes, he does. And he's saying, this is an expression of your love to me, is that you actually keep my commandments. That's how the world will see and know that you truly love Jesus, is that you keep his commandments. And that, those commandments are not burdensome if you love God. If you have the Holy Spirit of God living within you, it's not a burden to keep the commandments of God. You're not doing something, you're not putting off what you really want to do. You want to go out and get drunk and... Uh, 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 or, or whatever it is, or commit fornication, or make a load of money and, and tread on people as you climb your way to the top of your career ladder. It's not saying that's what I want to do, but I suppose I'm going to have to obey the commandments because I'm supposed to be a Christian and I don't want to go to hell, so I'll just try and do this. That's not the Christian life. The Christian life is I don't want to do those other things anymore. I've had enough of the world. It gives me no satisfaction. 
It's empty. It's vain. What was that hymn that we sang? Years I spent in vanity and pride. It's emptiness. It means nothing. It's for the refuse tip. It's, it, it's a waste of time. But what is not a waste of time is knowing Jesus. Knowing God. Having Him in your life. When you truly know Jesus Christ, what you want to do is His will. You don't want to do anything else. You want to do His will. The most beautiful time for you is in prayer, is in the Word, is sharing the Gospel with others. If that's not a beautiful time to you, if that's just a drag, better check your heart. Better check out what your relationship with God is like. If you find that a chore. If you, don't, if you find being in fellowship with God's people a drag, then you better get before the Lord in prayer and, and do what well, Paul says. Examine to see whether you be in the faith. Seriously. Because that is what a real Christian's life is like. I'm not saying we don't go through difficult times, hardship, but at the centre of who you really are, that is what you want as a believer. So it was good news for the Israelites that the Egyptians were overthrown and destroyed, but it was not good news for the Egyptians. And it was not good news for those unrepentant, pagan, heathen peoples around them. The Bible says, The people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold on the inhabitants of Palestina. Then the dukes of Edom shall be amazed. The mighty men of Moab, trembling, shall take hold upon them. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. Isn't that what Rahab said when they came to Jericho? We've heard what you did to the Egyptians. Everybody's afraid of what, of what your God can do. Because in the greatness of thine excellency thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. It says in the song of Moses. The greatness of God's excellency. That is... The greatness uh, of his majestic power. So whether you are an Egyptian, whether you are a Jew or a Gentile or anybody who opposes God. One thing is absolutely sure, you will be overthrown. You, you will not succeed in what you want to do. Lucifer tried it and he failed. The Egyptians tried it. And they failed. There are many others who have opposed God. And they also have failed. As we looked at last week in Psalm 2. Where it talks about uh, uh, the, why do the heathen rage and imagine a vain thing. That God looks down from heaven and he laughs. Causes them to laugh. And there they are with all thinking they're so sophisticated. They've got the very latest spear. Uh, you know, the, the, this latest weapon, high technology. You know, we look and laugh. Look at, look at the, you go to a museum to see a spear now. You know, look at that rusty old thing. Imagine, you know, people having that. We've got these super high tech weapons today. But God still looks down from heaven and laughs. It's a laugh of derision to those who think that they can oppose uh, an, an omnipotent, all powerful God. The creator and the sustainer of the universe. And, and Moses has them saying in the Song of Moses in verse 9. He says, even though the enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. That's what the enemies of God are, are thinking. That's what those unclean spirits, those demonic hordes are thinking we will satisfy our lust upon them. We will, we will spoil them. We, we, will, we will take hold of them. We will steal, kill and destroy. But oh my goodness, what a shock it is when that person turns to Jesus. Then the devils tremble. Then they are in fear. Because they know what that means. You've lost again. 
that God is going to be victorious in that person's life. And I tell you this morning, God can be victorious in your life if you respond in the right way. If you yield to God, to the right hand of the Lord, if you yield to the, the greatness of God's excellency, it is not you who will be covered over with the debt. It is your sins that will be cast into the sea. And you will be set free. You will, you will stand on that dry land and you'll look back and you'll see that defeat, those difficulties, those things that, that, that you thought you would never see the end of, those besetting sins, you'll see them covered over, as it were, and sink like a stone, like lead, beneath the depths. I think that's the promise of God this morning. You'll become victorious through Him. But that's not without cost, friends, this morning. That's, the Christian life does not come without cost. There's some things that you need to bring to the foot of the cross this morning. There's some things in your life, and maybe in my life, that we need to put at the foot of the cross. And leave on the altar and say, God, burn that up. Get rid of that. That, that is no good. It is, just, it is just a barrier between me and you. It's just something that gets in the way. You know, maybe it's a thing of the world that you're just kind of hanging on to. Well, you need to let it go and, and give all that you are to God. To allow God just to, to be who He is, to demonstrate uh, his, his majesty, His power in your life so that others can see it as well. The majesty of God. That He is majestic, glorious, immutable. That means, that means unchanging. He is incorporeal. He is omnipotent. He is incomparable. And all the other adject adjectives that we would use to describe God, you just run out of them in the end to describe Him because He's bigger than all that, isn't He? He's far bigger than any words that we can use to describe how wonderful and majestic and powerful He is. But it's good to remind ourselves, yeah, here was an army, the strongest armed force in the world that day. And yet God said in effect to the Hebrews, stand back, watch this. God sometimes says that to us, I believe, in our lives. Okay, you've tried everything. Stand back. Believe on me. Believe that I can do it. You know, as Christians, we're such, such uh, uh, pragmatists. You know, we're like tipping our toe into the water. Well, it looks a bit deep. How are we going to get across here? You know, have we got, anyone got a bridge? Anybody got any wood that we could make a boat out of, maybe? We're such pragmatists. Oh, it's got, we've got to, you know, let's see if this works. If it works, then it must be God. The Christian is called to walk in faith. To believe on the Lord. To believe on what God has said in His Word. And if God says He's going to do a thing, then He's going to do it. But for your part, my part, we must believe. We must believe on the Lord. And let Him do it. And I believe that we will see the majesty of God. Let's pray.